Well, the daffodils may be in full bloom, but the sun certainly isn't in Cardiff and through the rest of the UK, I think, this weekend. It's blustery, it's windy, and it's just about starting to rain. You can see uh, lots of cagoules being worn back there. Our first race this afternoon will be the women's, the elite women's half marathon. Mo Farah goes in the men's race and with the masses at 10 past two. Looking forward to that very much indeed. But this women's race is the one where we're going to see one or two of the new Kenyan names. We expect them to dominate. They took the first five places last time this event was contested two years ago in Copenhagen. A British team of five. All teams have five members or can have a maximum of five taking part. Australia have got quite a strong team. As ever, the strength of Ethiopia and Kenya will dictate, but Japan have won the bronze medal in the last few years. Just wonder how well Great Britain can do, led by Alison Dixon, who will be running in the London Marathon, hoping to secure her place in Rio. More of that, of course, looking forward to that in April. And there you can see all of the rest of the teams taking part. Big turnout in these World Championships in Cardiff. Only once has there been more athletes taking part than on this particular occasion. Held every two years now, it used to be held every year, but now just held every two years. And I'm not sure that many of them would have been thinking in the end of March to come to Cardiff and be faced with the sort of weather we, we've got here today. Well, joining me in the commentary box, somebody who knows how to win this race, Paula Radcliffe, and you know Cardiff pretty well, Paula. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, what we hope will be a great afternoon's racing. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think I was there yesterday running around this very area through through this start area and around Boot Park and beautiful sunny day. And I think the athletes would have loved to have seen that day maybe switched with today. But it is what it is. And it's the same conditions for all of the athletes out there. And if anything, it's conditions that the British athletes and European athletes in general are very accustomed to, to coping with. And it's just about doing your best on the day. Well, the weather certainly won't dampen the enthusiasm of the city and those who are going to come out and watch on the streets are expecting tens of thousands of people to watch. And there are around 16,000 will take part in the mass race with Mo Farah later. But as I said, we're going to concentrate on the women before that. This is one of the favourites, Wasera. She's wearing Ngugi on her uh, number, but we'll refer to as Mary Wasera. That's what she's uh, much better known as. Japan have got a pretty strong team. Shimitsu, perhaps the best of theirs, but uh, one or two others will be hoping but perhaps to be ahead of uh, their teammate. And Cynthia Limo, who has been running very, very quickly recently. You can see that personal best set earlier in the year, 66.04. And five of the world's top six women in 2016 are in this race so very much looking forward to what can happen there's Alison Dixon looking a little chilly she shouldn't she's from Sunderland at <laughs> Sunderland Strollers and uh, Ali's been in pretty good form she ran well in Berlin got her Olympic qualifying then but not yet selected herself Sonia Samuels others Charlotte Perdue's in the in the race here two three others we'll go through the British team shortly when they get underway and um, we'll talk a little bit about not only the British athletes, but others who will be hoping this race can help them head towards selection for Rio. So where they go then? The elite women underway, the world half marathon in Cardiff. Tough conditions, tough race, a flat and fast course. Had it not been as blustery today, we could have seen some very quick times, but it'd be interesting to see what sort of tactics are employed, particularly by the best runners I think we would have seen them heading out fast and hard from the beginning, but you just may have to hold back a little bit and just be careful, particularly when they head out around Cardiff Bay, expecting it to be blustery out there, when they'll get perhaps the full face of the wind. But then, just after halfway, they'll turn back and head back towards this area, starting right in front of Cardiff Castle. If you know Cardiff well, beautiful backdrop. And the city, as I said, delighted to be hosting this event. And it's becoming a bit of a... It's, it's a good habit, Paula, isn't it? We've had so many events we're looking forward to in, in the uh, next year or two. We've got, of course, the World Championships in London. We've got World Indoors coming to Birmingham, perhaps the European Indoors to, to Glasgow. So Cardiff playing its part in, um, in bringing big athletic events to the UK. It's great to compete in our country on home soil and all of the benefits that that brought including the home support but also the excellent organization and i think when you watch events like this it does make you proud to be british when you see how well 
the event is put on, how well the athletes are welcomed, and despite the weather, they're happy to be here racing in Cardiff, and there's a lot of support along the streets, and I think that was one of the worries. Obviously, it doesn't make that much difference you're going to race in the World Championships, whatever the weather does, but it does make a difference to the crowds that will come out and support, and hopefully we're going to see the people of Cardiff turn out in mass, uh, on mass, and watch this race and really get behind the runners. Of course, there are the mass runners going later on as well, um, 16,000 plus running there, so a lot of family and friends will be out supporting them around the streets as well. And supporting Mo Farah, of course. Mo will be uh, probably well into his warm-up now, maybe maybe a longer warm-up than um, than he might have been expecting, but uh, that race, the mass race, as Paula was saying, uh, with the elite men, offered 10 past two. But for now, as I said, we'll concentrate on this and we can have a little look at where they're going to head to, away from the castle and then down through Grangetown into Penarth, around by the marina there, that's at about three miles, and then around Cardiff Bay, and then past the Millennium Centre, back up through. This is really the important part of the race, when they're back with the wind, if you like, on their backs, and head up towards Roth Park Lake with three miles to go, and certainly for the elites, that's often where you'll see the real break being attempted, and then they'll finish back at the Civic Centre, not far from City Hall. So, as I said, flat and fast, uh, one or two little twisty, turny parts, but uh, it's, it's no reason why people, if they judge this right, just don't perhaps overcook it into the difficult conditions in the early stages, can still end up with a pretty swift time. Let's talk about the uh, British contingent, Paula, while I can see Ali Dixon still uh, very close in that lead group there. Ali, in fact, Ali's only race in 2016 was in the North East Road Relays at Hetton, which is where my family comes from. Um, but she's in good form and uh, very much looking to towards London. But she's joined by Rachel Felton, Tina Muir, who's been brought in uh, at the last minute, really. Gemma Steele only pulled out in the middle of the week. Charlotte Purdue, you mentioned, and Jenny Spink. Yes, uh, it's a strong British team. I think there's been a little bit of controversy around the selections for that. Um, Ali Dixon picked very much on form, but also on preparation, trying to help her get ready for the London Marathon. Susan Partridge maybe not quite afforded that... Um, privilege that chance when she probably should have been here uh, and racing here today and then a little bit surprised to see when Gemma Steele pulled out in the week that Susan wasn't then given the chance to to step in and race here but it is a strong team and it's a team that wants to perform well with a view to building on that for later in the year whether they're getting ready for the 10,000 meters on the track or that London Marathon to try and seal up the the qualifying spots for Rio. And Ali Dixon, Sonia Samuels ran very well, Sonia in particular in Berlin uh, back in September. And actually, not long before, um, Ali Dixon here ran the Great North Run, ran fairly swift at the Great North Run a couple of weeks before she went to Berlin. So this will give her a real indication of where she's at. Um, I'm not, I'm, I think she will go at this pretty hard, obviously. You wouldn't come and run this race and decide to take it easy. So it'll be interesting to see how Ali goes. I can see Aloise Wellings of Australia in the tall figure there, right in the sort of middle of the group with the uh, sort of blonde hair tied back in the group. So outside of the... Ethiopian and Kenyan contingents really difficult to see anybody else getting in there Paula particularly the Kenyans I'm not even sure that the Ethiopian team here is as strong as we've seen in recent years no I mean I think absolutely the the strength in depth comes from the Kenyans and that's probably evidenced by the fact that on the 2016 world list so far Kenya Phil eight of the top ten um, first places led by Cynthia Limo who's racing here today with um, 6604 um, and backed up by Mercy Wachero, Paris Jep Church here and Gladys Chiziri so from that they have really fielded a very very strong team. Ganet Ayalu or Yalu uh, from Ethiopia will be able to, to get in there and challenge you can see her in the Ethiopian vest obviously and just probably hidden from view at the moment in the middle of that pack so it's three to count for your team, and it's the times, actually, it's the cumulative time that uh, determines where the medals go. So Japan, Jap Japanese team, Japan well to the fore. Their women have always done very well, but the, the men are being tipped to do well in, in these championships, maybe more so than their women, but um, already gaps starting to appear, so suggesting that the early pace is not too slow at all, but to be fair, there's a big group there, and uh, it'll be 5k before we get a, a split and let us know exactly what sort of pace they're running. 
Of course, this is a world championship, so even though it's in the UK and we'd usually be talking about miles, etc., uh, we'll watch out. There are mile markers out there. We'll watch out for them as well. But for the, the purposes of an international road running event, it's the kilometre splits, 5K, 10K, which will be the ones we'll, we'll receive on screen. Yeah, I think out on the course there probably will be mile markers up um, to give the athletes that feedback, but predominantly it will be those 5K splits that they're looking for, so we may be able to get an idea if we catch sight of one of the mile markers, but it's probably going to be difficult to, to get um, an idea from that pace. What you can see from more well, from the long shot that was behind them there a second ago uh, was just how flat the course is, and it is a shame that that wind is as strong as it is today because I think the course organisers did put a lot of work into making sure that that this was a fast course as well as a good course and a course that would show off Cardiff and the highlights of Cardiff as you move around it. Um, so talking to some of the runners in and around the expo yesterday, they were saying that training generally around Cardiff, it's pretty hard to find somewhere flat, but they managed to do that predominantly throughout this race. There is a little bit of an incline around about 12 miles, but otherwise it's a pretty flat course. And that is going to impact, you know, the men's race. I think the tactics in particular will come into play. They know, you know, Mo Farah is, if they leave it towards the latter stages, he's going to be very dangerous. I was trying to use the phrase earlier this morning to describe Mo's task in this race. I said, it's, well, he's like going into their backyard, i.e. The, the, the guys who are specialists at half marathon. He's in their backyard, but in his backyard, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, you know, he's on home soil, but he, it's not his strong event so tactics in the men's race are going to be particularly intriguing um, as to what they will do because whereas here you just think that the, the Kenyan women will just think well we can run away from everybody yeah and I think that's absolutely um, the mindset that the Kenyan runners will have here today we might see some of the Ethiopian girls be able to to go with them I was actually chatting to Catherine Dereva who was um, former world record holder over the marathon distance uh, for women and is now um, team manager for the Kenyan team here and her picks were between Mary Wasera and Cynthia Limo today she said they're the two front runners in her team and she's expecting them to be able to, to comfortably run away from the field and the only kind of effect that the weather might have on that would be on how fast they're able to run uh, but looking ahead to to the men's race and what mo has to do i mean i think it's more that the other athletes the likes of karaki and kamura know what they have to do to be able to to beat mo and that is to to break him early in the race they cannot be getting within a, a sniff of the last mile and still allowing mo to be within shooting distance of them because they know time and time again they're just not able to run away from him in, in the closing stages well, still the early stages here. There's Ali Dixon. My dad, uh, Dave, was a, a very good distance runner in his day for at Sunderland, and Ali, very much a, a fixture in the local running scene in the uh, northeast. A very popular athlete, and worked hard to get to the position she's in, with a chance of going to the Olympic Games next year. But she knows she has to go to London, like everybody else, and produce a performance there. So looking for a confidence boosting run here I haven't really seen any of the other british contingent um anywhere near close to that leading group so ali's kind of you know has gone out here with real intent she tends to run like that paula even in her marathons as well it's you know she's not frightened to go out and trust herself and back herself doesn't always work out um but she's she's never scared of kind of setting off at a good pace no, absolutely not, and I think that's reflected often in her training as well. She will go out and she will push very hard on, on the long runs to be able to get that pace work and that quality work in, and sometimes that results in her getting a little bit uh, overtired coming into events, but I think she's really looked at, at this event as an important stepping stone towards London. It's not the primary target, but it is a target that she has backed off a little bit for this week and wants to use it as a, as a hard tempo run and as a good indication, as you say, um, in comparison with previous build-up half marathons before marathons uh, to get an idea uh, of what she can do in London and how to how to judge that and how to pace it so I know she'll be using it as well as, as a practice to, to take on board fuel and possibly gels that she would use in London not necessarily needed over a half marathon distance but practicing drinking the fluids and opening the gels eating the gels while moving along at race pace is something that's very hard to replicate in training so it, it's a good practice for that today.
Well, you can see some of the names uh, of the main contending teams or expected to be, but Japan are well represented in that big leading group there. And that Ethiopian team, Yalu Gideta, certainly are experienced enough to do pretty well here, but it's, uh, there isn't so much of a form line for them. The Ethiopians have used a, um, one and a half marathons held a, a month or two back as their main selection for this race. I mean, the Kenyans was interesting. You know, they, they, they probably had a... There was a bunch of other perhaps more famous names as well could have been here in this team. Um, but even without the big names, these are fast women who are running here. Um, right in the middle, you can see Jep Church here um, sort of looking forward, almost leaning forward a little bit. She's a real good young talent as well and has dipped under, gone under 67 minutes for the half marathon, improving athlete. And... You know, I, I was actually listening to an interview she did from a race she won in in, um, in Prague last year on the roads. And at that point, she was saying, I'm looking forward to try to make the 10,000 meter track team in Rio. She hasn't run a track race yet. So, and and this, is, this is, I think what we should explain here, there's a real mix in the half marathon between those who are, you know, the Mo Farahs of this world. And then you've got um, Kamwaro, who's a you know, world cross country champion. It's cross country, road racing, track real mix when you get to the half marathon which is what makes it int an intriguing event it is and i think it's what makes it a special event too and there are a lot of athletes that can run an outstanding and be really top of world class over the half marathon distance and just can't somehow manage to translate that to the marathon distance and so the likes of perez i know she paced in london last year um and maybe feels that she's more a lot more comfortable over the half marathon distance at this stage and at that point dropping down i guess pretty much half the distance to a 10,000 meters on the track isn't isn't that much different um i don't know it's a different surface but it's it's working more along the the same lines and i think if you look at um mo farah his potential over the marathon probably isn't i mean go out on a bit of a limb here but isn't as close as it would be his potential over the half marathon and i think that half marathon he is still very very strong very very tough to beat whereas we have seen that those weaknesses are there as he goes up towards the marathon which is to be expected when he's also world class at 1500 meters Well, if you are looking forward to seeing more, you're watching this uh, women's race, if you maybe watch the special programme we had before this, you want to get in touch, give us your thoughts, you can do that via hashtag BBC Athletics. As we watch the athletes start to approach the five kilometre point, that's when we'll get our first read indication of the pace. I'm suggesting, Paula, that the fact that that group is so big um, is that it's not that fast. It looks decent enough, it, they're not certainly not hanging around, and one or two are now just starting to drop off that lead group, so when they, uh, they do hit the five-kilometre point, we'll, we'll get a more accurate indication of the pace, but it, it looks decent enough without being super fast. Yeah, I mean, I, I would guess it's around about... 69 minute pace there maybe at the moment we'll see when we get um, to the first 5k split but just by the way that the field is gradually gradually whittling down nobody's made any conscious um, surge yet but you can see that people are just starting to drift off the back just incidentally the runner about to go under the bridge there in the white hat Kellen Taylor uh, of the US the US interestingly have selected a lot of their team from athletes who actually ran in their marathon championships probably only what five six weeks ago now um, so pretty short turnaround for them. And I was chatting to um, Sarah Hall uh, at the press conference yesterday and saying, well, how, how easy had it been to, to turn around from that? And she, of course, said, well, it was much easier because I didn't finish um, in L.A. But um, she was saying that they were very happy to see the conditions out on the course today because those trials in Los Angeles were hot. And I think a lot of the athletes struggled with that and are much happier running the longer distances in conditions like this. Yes, so Los Angeles uh, was a, a tough trial. Americans, uh, that's it. You go to the trials, and even, for, even in the marathon, it's top three, and that's it. So here we go. There's three miles. So 5K will be just beyond this. Three miles, Paula, so they're running about 5.20 pace, something like that. So it's not, as we suggested, not uh, super fast, but it's decent enough, and you just get the feeling it, it, because this group has broken up that it, they all of a sudden picked up the pace in that last half mile or so, because from a group of about 25 athletes, we've now whittled that down to about 12. It does look as though there's a slight incline as well there, um, which isn't, 
isn't significantly big, but it's obviously significant in the way that they're running up it because it's been enough to, to cause a bit of shuffling in the runners in the second pack as well and to allow this group to move away. So that's 16.31 there through the five kilometer marker and Kenyan team very much to the fore here, um, pushing on with the Ethiopians as is often their one sheltering in behind. Um, I think we'll see a little bit more of that sheltering going on as we get more into the windier sections. Just on the left-hand side there, you can see the drinks tables, obviously, um, set out there with um, with the flags and by country, so they know which um, table they will need to go to in alphabetical order as they're running down. Not too many athletes actually taking advantage of that. And if you look on the tables themselves, they're mostly bottles of water that seem to be laid out. So not really necessary to take on a lot of fuel over the half marathon distance and I'd guess that most of those drinks bottles out there are for athletes who are, have an eye on, on a marathon coming up and want to practice that drinking. And Louise Wellings just uh, trying to hang on to that group and interestingly in that lead group there you can see the leading Japanese athlete is Ando and Wellings beat Ando in a recent um, half marathon in Japan so she's using that as a bit of a benchmark as we just go through I mean, a few um, glitches water getting in the works obviously um, not able to quite bring you that the standings not quite so important at this point but you can see that big group all of the Kenyan team all of the Ethiopian team three or four is it four members of the Japanese team and now Eloise Wellings has got onto the back of that group there and that's who she'll have her eye on she'll be hoping she can beat two three of the Kenyans and Ethiopians but she knows she can beat uh, some of this Japanese team as well. So Eloise Wellings of Australia, very much in there. Tajeda, a little bit familiar to those who uh, watch a lot of athletics, is in that lead group as well. There's Wellings. Very good athlete, Eloise Wellings, and has uh, been in pretty good form over the last couple of years, ran in the World Championships in Beijing in the 5,000 metres, made it through to the final. So she's got that range. And that sort of track speed always helps when you come into, uh, certainly up to the half marathon, I think it, it can be a factor. You bring good 5 and 10k PBs to this sort of event, then it, then it always helps. And uh, that's something which uh, Sarah Hall, Paula was mentioning uh, a little earlier on. Sarah, as Paula said, dropped out of that trial, the uh, American marathon trial. And of course, when when that happens, Paula, you know, you, it kind of, you know, it, 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 it's a huge disappointment. But it does open up other options, including running the 10,000, perhaps. Um, but it gives you the, set, the chance to target events like this, I guess. Yeah, it does. And I think Sarah is one of those athletes who um, has only just recently kind of made that step up into to trying to, to achieve at the marathon. And the half marathon is a distance that she's probably ranked higher at and has is more comfortable racing over and um, moving up from that five, 10,000 meters on the track. Um, just wondering who her, uh, she's actually adopted with her husband, Ryan, um, adopted four young Ethiopian girls uh, in the last year or so and that's changed her preparation a little bit she was saying instead of bouncing around from sea level to altitude training camps they've been based in one place and I don't think the family have come over but if they're watching this I wonder which team they're cheering for <laughs> well talking of teams you saw the British team currently in 10th place through 5k as we look out they're in the Penarth area Penarth Marina and of course the Landscape of Cardiff very much changed over the years. Cardiff Bay Barrage will be uh, very much in sight. I'm not sure how much of the sights the athletes will take in, as ever. They tend to look at the bit of tarmac immediately in front of them, and um, all they see are yellow lines and white lines. But there's some of them will have been out in the last few days having a look around the course and trying to familiarise themselves with certain sections. I think it's always particularly the latter part of the course that people like to look at. If they if they know it's a flat and fast course, they would, if there were hills, they'd go and have a look at that perhaps. But if you do want to familiarise yourself with any part, it's the, it's the last few miles, isn't it? Yes, I mean, I think with shorter distances, cross-country, even up to 5K, 10K road races, you would take the opportunity to maybe jog around or walk around the course beforehand. With something like the half marathon, uh, the athletes were offered the chance of a bus tour around the course, but it was going to be sitting cramped in the bus day before the race um, for over two hours and I think that was one that they decided it was better off not to do that and they would probably take the opportunity since it's not 
on this course too far from the hotel to, to go and make sure that they are familiar with that start um, portion and with the finish portion, as you say, of the course. Uh, a lot of them will probably have been going into nearby Boot Park to do some of their training runs uh, and shakeouts before the race and will have had the opportunity to explore around that finish area and just make sure that they're familiar with any twists and turns as they come into that. You may have seen the four mile mark just being passed around 21 minutes and 25 seconds. So maintaining the pretty much the same sort of pace. If anything, that mile tad slower. There was a water station in there. But good to see people out supporting them. The rain hasn't really come down here. It was forecast for right around two o'clock when the main race gets going. It is overcast, it is very windy, but at least they're getting some protection from the houses here. It'll be when they come out into the bay and that's when they'll face the worst of the windy conditions, I would think. But goodness me, the water looks pretty still there, doesn't it? Yeah, I was just having a look at the trees by the side of the road as they were running along that section, and that section looks particularly sheltered. It um, didn't really look as though the wind was, was too bad at all. I think at the start of the race, the forecast was, or the conditions were about 14 miles per hour wind, but it was forecast to, to increase another 10 miles per hour during this race. And I think the portion of this race where they will feel that the most is as they run across the, the barrage across to Cardiff Bay there. Um, and it will be trying to, I guess, maintain a straight line and just um, save as much energy as possible and just get your head down uh, and run into those conditions. Yeah, that's my stupidity, of course, with the barrage there, then that helps in terms of having safe havens for all the boats, etc. And if you lived there, that's where you'd have your boat, wasn't it? I think Colin lives around there, you know. He actually does, doesn't he? Yes, our, our, um, our colleague, Colin Jackson, who has been part of the um, ambassadorial programme of getting people involved in, in, the, in the events and the popularity of running right around the world and running events doesn't seem to be abating at all. I'm sure pretty many of you were out on a park run or something similar this morning. Despite the weather, we picked a good day yesterday in the northeast. We had the Good Friday road relays yesterday, so we picked a good day. It was beautiful yesterday. Pity that I couldn't have been carried through, but I think for a lot of athletes, you know, you, 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 your experience, Paula, is one that says, look, you know, whatever the conditions, you, you have to come prepared. And for even for the Kenyans and Ethiopians, I know we go on about, you know, this, this might be difficult. Mo's kind of hoping that's the case in, in, in his race. But, but these guys race around the world and they race in all sorts of conditions. And one or two of them were even racing at New Year on, on the roads and it was a lot colder than this. So, um, you know, they, they're not totally unfamiliar to coming and running in, in conditions which aren't ideal. Yes, I mean, I think um, when you're a professional athlete and you're in shape and you're ready to race, you can r race well and race strongly in any conditions. And it's more whether you mentally let it be a factor to affect you. Uh, and the likes of Kamwara um, and uh, Karake, uh, they're too strong to allow that to, to be a factor mentally. They will have come here very well prepared and the changes in conditions aren't going to make a huge difference. I think where we have in the past seen it make a difference in terms of um, possibly closing that gap between the European athletes and the, the Kenyan and Ethiopian athletes has been in world cross countries when it's been very muddy, very snowy um, and more in the junior teams where that inexperience shows just in competing on that kind of conditions but now the athletes in the senior races will be very accustomed to to traveling all over the world and racing in all types of conditions i apologize for some of the glitches with the uh, technology and the timing um, but i can give you an update on the british performance through 5k we saw ali dixon she wasn't too far behind the leader 1635 next was charlotte Perdue who was in 37th position and then not far behind, well, about 30 seconds behind her, there was Spink and Felton together, and then Tina Muir just a couple of seconds behind. 17.40 her time through the first five kilometres. So we'll try and bring you uh, updates, but we are having a, a few problems with uh, receiving the times and the positions of the athletes further down the field, but we'll do our best. Apologies for that. We are not in control, sadly, of uh, that element of, um, of the broadcast here, so the pictures 
of the front of the race. We can obviously see what's happening, but a little bit further down, uh, we tend to rely on getting the information from the all the athletes wear chips, as we see Tejeda of Peru. Uh, now finding yourself about 50 metres back from that lead group. So, yes, we do normally get those split times, but um, we'll do our best to bring them through to you as we as and when we get them. I think that was the five-mile marker that they just ran through there. So that last mile has picked up. Um, that was Tejeda going through it in 26.35. I made it. So that would be a 5.10 pace for her. So they've definitely increased as, as they came up and through possibly that sheltered area um, and now going out across the barrage. And you can see that by how much the, the field is starting to string out and the gaps growing behind. So down to now just Kenyans and Ethiopians at the front. You can see the, the Japanese girls have been the victim of that uh, increase in pace there, and they're just dropping back down the road behind as this obviously comes down to a team battle now between uh, Kenya and Ethiopia for the victory in the team race. Cynthia Limo, Paris Church here, leading the way at the moment. And... Just behind them, Mary Wansera looks very comfortable. The one wearing Ngugi on her uh, name on her uh, on her vest. And the Ethiopians just look like they're beginning to work hard. Just feel it lifting all the time and one by one. And of course, when there's only three Ethiopians left, as they are at the moment, then that becomes a bit more difficult for them to really try and control things, although Yalu there just moving with a Gadetta suddenly on the other side, the two of them thinking, right, we'll have a go here. As we now just have a quick look back at the start. So yes, we're just about... uh, more of that coming in just a few minutes. He's about six, seven minutes away from the start of his race. Meanwhile, the crowds out in force here as the main feed station just at around 10k, just for 10k. Important part of the race because things have picked up and it's been the Ethiopians have been trying to set the pace, mix things up a little bit. Gudetta and Yalu in particular just pushing things on in such a way that, yes, it's uh, making, or well, they've dropped a couple of their own teammates, but putting a little bit of pressure on the Kenyan quintet who are still all there, all of the five Kenyans still very much to the fore. And they... I'm sure we'll uh, keep picking up that pace and that group will get whittled down one by one. Well, as we have a great view looking down now, we get ready for the start of the men's race. The team's just going through there. As I said, Mo Farah leading the British team. We'll go through the rest of the team for you shortly. And again, in terms of team competitions, we're expecting Japan to do pretty well, but uh, with Mo right up there, you know, when you get a fast time with one of your runners, you, you, you know, you, you never know, you never know. But, uh, it's going to be difficult to get in amongst it, I would imagine, for the, uh, in terms of medals, but maybe a top five, top six placing for the British team, and that would be a good result. United States, not as well represented as they could be here. So let's have a look at some of the main contenders. Uh, just to the left there, I would say, uh, rather than Adola, the man who is the perhaps the pre-race favourite here, wearing the cap, Jeffrey Kamwara, the world cross-country champion, chased Mo Farah home at the World Championships last year. Kamwara is a huge talent on the roads, and he knows how to win this title as well. 58-54, his personal best. Phenomenal athlete, and will test Mo Farah completely and utterly today. You can see if you just even compared personal bests, that's uh, world half marathon or half marathon times have to be on certified routes as well. So that's Mo's official, although he has run faster at the Great North Run, his official best. And then this man, Bedan Kuroki, you heard Mo talking about him. These two guys, two of the best Kenyans around, if not the two best Kenyans around, both on the track and on the roads. This guy's pretty good as well. Amla Som, Eritrea will not, I don't think, be able to defend their title here at all. And then the rest of the British contingent will go through in just a second. But let's get the race underway. Big 
crowds at the star line and they don't have far to go to the finish but the athletes have got 13.1 miles to go oh there's a fall at the start it went, I think it was Kamwara I think it was Jeffrey Kamwara one of the pre-race favorites who fell right at the start there and that I hope he's okay a horrible way for him to start the defense of his title and he's a long way back because of course what happens then is people are running over the top of you you can't get on your feet you can't get up and he's also now going to have to try and wind his way through an awful lot of athletes to right at the start of this world half marathon Mo Farah's chances perhaps improve because the energy Kamwara is going to have to expend just to get back to the front here will be certainly detrimental to his chances here that's Kuroki there wearing it he's got again Mashiri on his uh, on his name Ayel is going crazy here over the first part but ah, it's terrible that uh, Paula yeah let's just have a look I mean, let's have a look at this here but this is not what you want to see at the start of a race yeah he's slipped and then athletes are falling on top of him falling on his back and then you can see some of the other uh, guys around are trying to to help him get up and pick himself up again but it took a long long time there uh, before he was up and running and you have to worry the speed that he went down the force that he went down with as well has he done himself um, any injury damage there uh, which is going to make it even more difficult as well as weaving his way in amongst all of those athletes to try and make up the ground gradually as he can back to this lead group and Ayala there I think has, has realized okay something's happened Kamura's not there um, here's my chance let's make this hard from the start and make his job of catching that distance back up if he's able to do that that much harder well it's a shame for the race as well you know we build this and, and around the world people were really looking forward to Kamura against his teammate uh, Karoki but also against Mo Farah, the three of them rejoining their battle that we saw on the track last year here on the roads in Cardiff. And uh, his only hope is that things don't go fast. But of course, here we have Ayala taking them out at a decent pace, stretching the lead group already, which is not what we saw in the women's race. And so that's not going to help him either. And well, Mo Farah, Mo may, may well be looking around. It may well be dawning on him uh, what's happened because uh, I'm sure Mo, well, he certainly knows Jeffrey pretty well. He'll know he's not in that group. He'll wonder why. Maybe put two and two together. I think he, I saw Mo looking around as well, you know, 30, 40 metres after the start. I think he was aware something had happened. And, uh, well, he may well get a message as well, perhaps from British contingent out there. Uh, but for the time being, oh, there he is there, Kamwaro. Now, if he's got back to the start, there he is. He was definitely him who fell, and he, he lost Paula, his hat. well, yeah, of course he lost his hat, but, well, uh, that is incredible, he's got back so quickly. I suppose that's what you have to do, we always say that on a track race, if you fall, you haven't got as long, of course, you've got to get back as quickly as you can, but within reason, you've got to expend, you know, the, <laughs> as little energy as you can getting back in contact. Here it is. It's yeah, definitely we'll him who goes. Here. It's his, second, his first stride down and he just I think slips. somebody catches his yeah, foot behind. Yeah, I think behind. somebody maybe caught him from behind yeah. there. Um, and then you, but you can see, see the Mo looking around on, there. on his back. Yeah, you, Mo, you're aware when you're yeah, running Mo and you, even if you're ahead, you, you're aware of who's gone down. And then in the first um, 10 metres, 20 metres, you're looking around to see is everybody there that should be there. And he will have quickly realised that Kamura was not there. So put two and two together and, and realised that it was him that had fallen. And as much much as it's kind of, I guess, not a nice way to have it, but a little bit of a boost for Mo to realize that it's Kamura that's fallen. It's also a little bit of a blow when Kamura gets back to the pack that quickly and settles back down again in front of, of Mo, because he will see there that, yes, it might have been him that's fallen, but it doesn't seem so far to have affected his race that much. I think the key when you fall like that is to make it up gradually um, and as smoothly as possible. So you do get back into contact as quickly as you can, but you don't expend too much energy because you you do undoubtedly when you fall like that experience a sudden surge in adrenaline which can make you do rash things and run a little bit too quick which you don't want to be doing in in the first mile of a half marathon you want to be able to to expend that energy gradually and to to keep a lid on the the levels of lactic acid in your body there and just be able to to gradually pull back but i think what he benefited from there kamura was also his teammates consciously trying to slow down the pace so as much as Ayala was probably unusually for 
an Ethiopian trying to, to lead out the field in the very early stages and really get them moving along. The other Kenyans um, athletes behind very much ran almost in um, formation across the road trying to, to keep the pack and the pace steady until Kamora was able to work his way back. Well, what a start. We couldn't have envisaged that. And whatever happens now, that it will be referred to, obviously, whatever the results. And if Kamwara were to come away with a win here, that would be a phenomenal performance from the Kenyan. So Mo Farah tucked into that group. It has settled down a little now after a little bit of a crazy first, in all respects, first kilometre. And... The conditions are certainly deteriorating a little bit, but, but not too bad. Given everything that we were told, and I think what Cardiff was bracing itself for, uh, so far it, it is windy, it is breezy, and it is raining, um, but it's not quite apocalyptic, is it? So Ayala moving off, off to the side, and uh, his time in front may be already up. This is going to be interesting, because I know what Mo thought was going to happen was that perhaps one of the lesser Kenyans, like Kip2, for instance, might just be asked to take it out for Kamwara and for Baroki, uh, Karoki. And it looks as though Kip2, well, he's, he's tracking Ayala stride for stride as he weaves across the road, trying to get rid of his shadow. Um, not able to at the moment, but uh, maybe Kip2 might be the one who uh, said... Um, I said, Seb, Mo was thinking, you know, they might sacrifice somebody, but look how it's slow, look how the group's gathered, and maybe Kip 2's job is to try and make sure there's, there's some pace maintained. But well, that only works, though, Paul, if the others go with him. Yeah, that's what, just what I was about to say. I think it, there's not much point telling somebody that you're going to go ahead and you're going to push the pace and really keep it moving at a decent pace for us if you're not then going to go with that. And I think that's what we're seeing there. The, the other runner's reluctant to, to go with that quicker pace in the early stages. Um, and I think I was finding it quite funny there, the Ethiopian athlete for once trying to get away from the lead and it, it was the Kenyan athlete, usually the roles are reversed there um, and it's usually the Ethiopian athlete who will be sitting on, on someone's shoulders but again back to the women's race and it's another Ethiopian in Gudetta who's who's pushing the pace on I think when we saw them last saw them it was around about that six mile and um, ten kilometer stage and it was very much then the two Ethiopians pushing the pace and trying to hurt the Kenyan athletes a bit. Yeah, the 10K time was 32.34. We didn't get a, an official split. I can tell you it was 32.34. So uh, they picked up a little bit. Um, it's still a pace which uh, should be comfortable for most of them here. So the second 5K quicker than the first. And that pace looked as though it's continued to be kept on. Gudetta in particular, as Paula was saying, wanting to push it on. But Mary Wasera. And Gugi is there. Jeb Cheche, this exciting new talent from Kenya, is there. And Cynthia Limo, the fastest in this field this year, over on the right as you look at it, looking pretty comfortable as well. But it's these next three or four miles, isn't it? And then, yeah, you start, you, you, this is when fatigue just starts to begin to creep in. You know, you can't run even at this pace, although it's well within the compass of most of these athletes. This is when you, you start to know if it's your day or not. You know, how, how hard am I working at this place? Am I, am I struggling to stay with this? Is this still pretty comfortable? And uh, those thoughts will be going through the, the head of, of these athletes just now. And so back to, to the men's race here, and we can see certainly somebody's decided that um, now Kip2 isn't going to be the only one, and it's Mashira who's taken on the, the job of trying to work together with Kip2 at the front there, and straight away Mo has reacted to that and is almost running on his own now. I mean, it's not exactly in, in no man's land there because the, the gaps are very, very small at this point, but um, he has recognised that danger and, and moved to cover it. This seems uh, reasonably swift there. If that, if that was two miles at just over nine minutes, that, that's quick. So, um, you know, it is a World Half Marathon Championship with a great field in, but look at uh, Bedan Karoki. He's w with his teammate K Kip2, as Paulo was saying, Mo Farah just slots back into that group because I think he's got his eye a little bit more on Kamwaro, but that, that's going to be a danger in terms of... And it's difficult for Mo, isn't it? He, I don't think he's expected to win this race. I think, you know, if it was a flat-out race, uh, 
if if he were to beat those two at the half marathon then goodness me they might as well all go home before the olympics but you know it, this might not be a flat out race they're trying to make it so and so mo now has got to decide okay if you're going to go flat out to be fair i'm going to let you do that but i'm going to keep my eye on on Jeffrey Kamwaro, because he might judge his pace a little bit better here. I think he was the pre-race favourite. The question, of course, is how much did that fall and having to catch up, how much did that affect his ability to go quicker? Would he be right alongside Bedan Karoki here if he hadn't fallen? Yeah, and I think that that is the question. I mean, certainly the the form guides coming out of Kenya recently were that actually Bedan Karoki, who's running here with Mashiri on his vest, would be um, the favourite actually coming into this event. He has been racing quite a bit, and I guess that's the only downside to that. He did race very recently in the last 10 days or so, and did a double in Nakuru, which is still at 6,000 um, feet of altitude, running a 1,500 metres in 3:42 and a 5,000 metres in 1338 just 45 minutes between those races so he's certainly in shape and in very very good shape and recognizes that uh, he is in that form right now and his best bet to be able to walk away from this with the title is to make it hard from the start and really take the race to Mo Farah and now you can see the effect that that effort and surge that he's putting in is having on this field so Kenya well to the four and uh, if you're watching our program, Can Seb Co Save Athletics beforehand, I know many of you will have been. Kenya itself under scrutiny if, in terms of it, the um, issues around doping, etc. And uh, I know one or two of you have passed on your comments uh, rather interestingly. And uh, one of them that came in from Alistair Canlin, and he said, 10 year bans. That's a obviously long ban, payback all earnings. I know that's something Paul is keen on. Prison time for drug supplying coaches. I think I'd agree with that as well. And make cheating properly punishable. Those are his comments, and I think uh, pretty valid ones there. Uh, you know, the, uh, but I think those are the messages coming out. You have to bear in mind that some of the penalties being handed out for athletic in within athletics have to sit within the overall picture of, of WADA and the and the overall world the drug testing regime. But life bans and longer bans certainly there the needs to be. Um, I guess tougher penalties available, a wider range of penalties available. And as you've rightly said, Paula, this is where a lot of athletes earn a lot of money on the roads. They're not household names, they're not the Usain Bolts. Most track stars actually don't earn very much money. You might be surprised to hear the big money in, in athletics in our sport is in road running. It's in marathons, half marathons, 10Ks around the world. And there are many people earning a lot of money doing that. And as you said, that, you know, those have been caught should be paying some of that money back. Yeah, absolutely. I think they should be paying all of it back. And I think that was um, one of the points we're trying to reach out to, to race directors um, and, and trying to push that forward and saying, yeah, OK, we can't maybe legally get a lifetime ban in the sport, but we can make them pay back all of the prize money before they're allowed back. I mean, I am someone that I do believe it's an honour and a privilege to take part in our sport, and it's not a basic right, so we shouldn't allow you back to the party until you have fully repaid back all the money that is actually owed to, to other athletes there. Another tweet, this one uh, came in from Marco, and he just basically says he's fighting a losing battle, referring to Seb, the sport is in denial. Um, I don't think it is, I mean, I, th I think the sport is, and you probably saw from what Seb said, we're well aware of the issues, I think uh, as we just see them go through a very quick five kilometres there, 15.46, and come back to that in a second, um, it's a very wide-ranging point to make the sport is in denial, I think huge parts of our sport really want to make big changes and I think Seb is well aware of that. The question is, I think towards the end of that program we make the point that our sport has many different facets and not everybody agrees with the way forward and at some point he's going to come up against some intransigence within the sport. Um, road running is different to track running, track is different to field events etc. So we all have opinions about how we go forward. He's somehow got to pull them under one umbrella and, and, and but he's also got to try and move pretty quickly Paula. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think the sport is in denial at all. I think the fact that um, we are facing up to the problems and that as many people are being caught, that action was taken against Russia and then will be against other countries if need be in the future shows that it is being faced up to. And if you're fighting a losing battle, I think if you're fighting for a sport that you care about, as so many of us, I think, in our athletics are, then it can never be a losing battle. A losing battle is sitting back and doing absolutely nothing to try and make the situation better. And I don't think that's the case in athletics right now.
Well, that's the men there in that group's just come back together. In the women, we saw the pace very much being picked up, 48, 14 through 15 kilometres. And the, uh, just news on the Brits through the previous checkpoint. Alison Dixon still was the first of the British contingent, went through 10K in 33-36 in 21st place. Uh, in terms of the team competition, Japan uh, doing pretty well. They had their three top counters inside the top 14, so we'll bring you up to date with that uh, pretty quickly. America not too far behind them, so that may be interesting, the battle for the bronze medal position as the race continues. Well, it's a bit up and down here in the men's race, isn't it? They're approaching uh, when they get to water stations as ever. A little bit of a rise here as well. And uh, look at Kuroki. They're, they're not hanging around here, Paula. This is this is hard and it's quite brutal at, at this early on. And look at the rain as well, as we see there through 5K, 14.10. So a very, very good pace being set in the men's race. And that is something which would set them for something about 59 and a half minutes, which in these conditions, would be pretty good and if Kamwaro can run 59 minutes of falling down at the start and chasing everybody he's a very very good athlete just very quickly we haven't talked about the the rest of the British contingent um, in that men's race Paula but again one or two others who've got their eyes the likes of Callum Hawkins Ryan McLeod etc on, on Olympic selection yeah they are and we've also got um, local boy uh, Debbie Griffiths running there um, running strongly and representing the Welsh contingent. And I'm sure he will be getting a lot of support uh, as he races out there today. So you just saw the women's standings through 15K, that lead group then. Kenya and Ethiopia well to the fore once more. There's Ali Dixon just dropping back a little bit now. She did go off pretty hard, 27th place now, two and a half minutes behind the leaders. Uh, but Ali probably, as I said, will have thoughts very much on, on London. And as we just start to watch and see this, this group whittle down one by one, we said that would happen because the pace has been picking up all the time. So five athletes here, the three best of the Kenyans for my money are there, the two, definitely the two best Ethiopians. The uh, question is now, it's not going to be a clean sweep this time for Kenya. They've had the top five places two years ago in Copenhagen. That's not going to be the case here, but goodness me, they certainly will want to be one, two and three, won't they? Yes, they will, and I think it's going to be fast as well, given the conditions there. I caught a glimpse, I think, of the 10-mile marker just a little bit ago, just around about the 51, 51 and a half minute uh, mark. So that is good pace, and that's um, certainly, I would say, sub-68 minutes, um, maybe pushing down towards uh, 66 minute territory and uh, that's moving fast and you can see that by the damage that's been done further back down the field looking back down the road there I can only see Chiziri the, the other Kenyan girl who dropped off recently and behind that I can't see any more athletes even within a sight of this uh, of the leaders in this race and certainly they look very very comfortable look how comfortable Mary Wasera looks there with Ngugi on her vest one of the definite favorites I think here today Well, this stage, uh, there's the men through four miles in uh, just 18-16, uh, around about that. So that pace being maintained, and look how hard Mo Farah is working. The hat's come off. He's already struggling to stay with this very quick pace, and look how many men are going with it. Now, Mo, if he concentrates, he'll pick some of those off, but he won't want to be... I would think if Mo ends up, you know, not in the top five or six, he'd be pretty disappointed. I'm, I'm not sure even Mo Farah, he said in our interview, of course, that you are going to all races wanting to win. Of course you do, all athletes do. But you sometimes think, you work out, well, what would be a good result for me here in a hard run race? I know that Kamwaro is good. I know that uh, Kuroki is good. But there are other athletes ahead of him here who he would expect to beat over this half marathon distance. Yes, I think there are, but it's early stages yet. And one thing that Mo is very good at is, is judging his pace and not being afraid to back off a little bit if he thinks he's going to be able to, to close stronger. So I think what he's trying to do here is expend a, as little energy as possible while still maintaining contact with this lead group and, and just to sit back a little bit. Having spent some time in E10, one of the... Um, 
key training sessions of the Kenyan athletes there is that fartlek session and it seems to be a little bit of that that's been happening in this race so far we've seen Karaki go to the front twice now already and really push the pace hard string out the field and then drop back again and as I say that there is that him going to the front once more to, to try and do that and that's a very very hard way to run that yo-yoing of the pace uh, we talked about when Kamora fell that he wouldn't want a yo-yoing pace to in terms of getting back to the lead group because it does just sap your legs a little bit more and certainly will take the sting out of any finishing speed that you have over that last mile or so so Mo doing a, a much better job at keeping his pace gradual I think that's why we're seeing him drop back and then close back towards that leading group and he'll be trying not to panic as well about the fact that there are so many guys up ahead of him on the road and you know what will, what will help him, Paula, if he does judge it right, is as they drop off that group one by one, which they will inevitably do because there are some people in that group running uh, perhaps a little bit too quick, then that, you know, having people to pick off as you go through obviously helps. Women's race looks like they've slowed a little bit here, maybe just uh, backing off that really hard pace. That 15.46, that five-kilometre section they went through, uh, that's low 66 running. Um, and no wonder they've backed off that a little bit. So it's back to the Ethiopians with uh, Gudetta and Yali. We've got Mary, Wasera on the left there, Wasera and Gugi on the far side, Cynthia Limo, and right in the middle, the young talent of Perez Jepchurch here, watching the Ethiopians and perhaps waiting, letting them do the hard work, letting them set the pace and then waiting for the moment and it's got to happen fairly soon so sometime Paula soon someone's gonna to have to break this up yeah I think they are and I think they will all have come into this uh, with their, their race plans you just saw Mary Wasera there a little glance over her shoulder maybe checking how far back um, Chiziri was maybe she figured a little bit in the, the Kenyan team plans for this race but I think she's more likely just checking the distance back to the next athlete because if they want to slow down the race a little bit at this point and, and then pick it up moving in they obviously don't want to slow it down so much that athletes behind then are able to, to get back in touch with the leading group. They were being slowed down by the lead vehicle there. That's not what you want to see. Um, police outriders in the lead vehicle maybe getting caught up with the crowds and the athletes almost went into the back of them there. But and now the road clear ahead of them and the road clear in the men's race. So Mo Farah at the back there, one or two looking around. Mo looks pretty relaxed in his face, which is good. And uh, as you said, Paula, he's got huge experience in terms of getting his pace right he'll know what he's capable of from the training he's been undergoing as ever preparing in uh, in Oregon and he was outlining in the interview if you're with us earlier on about he already knows his track plans he'll be in Eugene 5,000 meters he'll be in Birmingham at the Diamond League the week after that and then of course he'll be back in London for the Diamond League in his last big race before he heads off to Rio as well so the preparations already there the plan is there and this part of his Rio plan to get himself in the right sort of shape and we can see him there I think that's Mekin and he's just moving alongside as that pace perhaps just slowed a little bit at the front again whenever you see them bunch you know that uh, they've just backed off and another little look at the watch and they're saying come on we've got to keep this hard we've got to keep this going but this is what Mo was expecting yeah you can see there um Karaki just taking a look around to take um takes uh, just start of how many uh, of the runners are still there and how many have been damaged by that surge uh, exactly what a fart leg is is basically based on the Swedish word for speed play so it means uh, injections of pace running faster and then backing off slightly not to a jog but just backing the pace back again before surging again and that type of yo-yoing of the pace does do damage but it's also a very effective training tool and one that they use around the, the dirt roads around E10 to, to very very good effect Well, the rest of the British men through 5K, or certainly the, the three more to the four. Griffiths was 27th, McLeod was 37th, and Hines was 45th. Again, we'll give you uh, updates uh, as and when we get them. And in the women's race through 15K, we saw Ali Dixon behind her. Charlotte Perdue was 40th. Tina Muir had moved up to be the uh, next counter in 53rd place. So approaching the hour mark, approaching the part of the race where if you want to win it or are you prepared to try to win it at this point are you going to wait are you going to just see whether you can outkick the others or well, Sarah might be the favorite there but then more often than not we always go back to the old adage the Brendan Foster adage that a, 
a good Ethiopian always out kicks a good Kenyan. Not sure if that's always the case, but certainly it has tended to be just a little acknowledgement there of a click of the heels from uh, Perez, Jep Chechen, they're allowing her, and actually very kindly pointing out that there's a car parked, moved out and uh, made sure that Gadetta had room as they go alongside Roth Lake Park. The rain seems to have abated somewhat, thank goodness. The wet roads. And when they get to the top end of the park, they'll turn and they'll head back. Could well be a breeze in their face over the last couple of kilometres, the last two miles. They turn just before the 11-mile point, which actually they must have turned already, Paula, um, judging by uh, the clock. Oh, I'm trying to work out because I can still see the water on the left-hand side, so I think they have to turn around that and, yeah, be coming back down. Yeah, the water's on their left, so they, the are, they are so, heading yeah, back down. At 11 miles, they'll have turned the point to coming back um, and we'll be then running back into the wind. The um, information we're getting from out on the course is that the worst of the wind is between five and six miles, and then they have it at their backs for a good stretch, which has certainly been evidenced by the, the speed of, that the women were able to run at in that section, and then just a little bit in their faces in the closing couple of miles. And all of a sudden the pace picks up as the first real effort here, and it's coming from the youngster, Perez Church here, who's having a great race here and uh, has had a, a great preparation leading into these championships. We'll come back to that very, very shortly. Back in the men's race, that group it's getting smaller and smaller all the time. Another surge, Paula mentioned fartlek. If you haven't done fartlek, give it a go, it hurts. Uh, every Saturday morning in the park for me at this time of the year. And a great part of a lot of athletes' preparations, whether you're a 1500 meter runner or a marathon runner. And look at that, the three Kenyans forging on and putting some big gaps between themselves. And they'll, they'll be buoyed by this. They'll, they'll say, this is working. This is giving us, um, a big gap over there's Mo Farah. Now Mo will just keep picking off those who drop off this pace. There's a group of three. He's going to just get onto the back of that Kiptu, who was the early sacrificial lamb, if you like, for the better Kenyan athletes, who was the first to inject a bit of pace as they pass through six miles, not far away from the 10K point. And look at that, 27 minutes, so they're thereabouts through six miles. So that means they're going to be 28 and bits through 10 kilometers. Is this a section where there are big crowds? And if anything, Paula, if that was, uh, well, it will, of course it will be accurate, the 10K, I'm expecting them to be about 28.15, maybe 28.20, so maintaining the hot pace they set through the first 5K. Yes, they definitely are. A little bit of confusion there. We saw uh, Karaki just deciding at the last moment to dart in and try and get his drinks bottle, and he missed that. Um, it did, I did see Kamwara got his, so maybe they will share that, and he won't have to do without his drinks bottle at this stage, but he probably should have realised that when he saw all the flags and all the tables lined up that he needed to be thinking about picking his bottle up. As you see, back down to the women's race and the uh, Kenyan tactics of pushing the pace when they did have paid off now and it looks like a, a Kenyan 1-2-3 certainly in this race moving away with probably unusually it's Wasera of the three Kenyans who is struggling to, to hold on and not looking, although she still looks very comfortable, she's not looking good in her, in her leg turnover and leg pickup at, at this stage and that key look back there signifies okay I'm not going to try and go with the girls in front now I'm looking back to see where the dangers for the bronze medal are going to come from So Wasera, the first to break here and it's the youngster Perez Jepcheche, I'm not saying anything Paula but I'd written in my notes possible surprise winner beforehand uh, the, you're, when you're an improving young athlete, she's only run two half marathons, has got quicker with each one coming into this Obviously, with, with that confidence of having run pretty quick in uh, the RAK half marathon, she didn't win it, but she ran fast. But she has run pretty well, pretty fast on the roads at 10K, etc. Beaten good people. She's had a big year last year. But Cynthia Limo is the fastest, and she still has Cynthia Limo to deal with here. She doesn't have to worry about Mary Wansera. She looks as though she's going to have to keep working hard for the bronze medal and leave the battle for the goal to her two teammates out in front of her there. Not long to go, just about three minutes of running, maybe a little bit more left here. So who out of these two will be the quicker? Jep Cherche, look at that, 15.53, another fast 5K, Paula. Jep Cherche, I said, has no track pedigree. Cynthia Limo, 
um, not much either. So uh, the two of them not really tested in the sense of uh, we could say, yeah, you've got the better track speed. But uh, Limo has won big races. But Jet Church, uh, look at her. She uh, looks strong, doesn't she? She does, but just look the, at the contrast in style of the two runners. And Jep Cheche is very, very rocking side to side and probably wasting a little bit of energy there. I'd say she's um, well, obviously been younger. She's much more of a, a raw talent, whereas Cynthia Lima, I think hers is very metronomic, that long loping stride there, but very little arm movement to, to waste energy there. And certainly the more experienced racing over this half marathon distance, but it doesn't always come down to experience. It comes down to who who wants the victory more and who's got that little bit more energy left in the legs as we get into these closing stages. And the closing stages will determine the gold medal here. Kenya undoubtedly looking for a 1-2-3 and heading that way as long as Wancero doesn't completely fall apart in these uh, closing kilometre or so, but the front two Who's going to win this? This 22-year-old, as Paula was saying, rock and roll style, but does look very strong from the from the waist down, if you like. A strong stride she's got there. But then on the other side, the Cynthia Limo, the one who knows she's got the fast time and maybe frightened there about the possibility of a sprint finish, just pushes on, and all of a sudden it's a two-three meter gap, and that looks as though it's going to continue to extend. Yeah, that was a, a quick um, opening up of that very small gap. It's still a gap that could close, um, but certainly it looked a little bit like maybe the elder team may, making a little bit of a move. She doesn't want to leave it to, to come down to a sprint finish. She maybe fears the, the finish of Chip Chichi, who, having said that, now does pull alongside it as they come over that small crest there. I mean, I wouldn't call it a, a big hill there, but it's certainly somewhere that enabled Cynthia Limo to eke out a little bit of a lead, um, which was then quickly made up there um, and someone decided no I'm not going to give up on this race now you still have a battle on your hands for the victory here today and it's amazing isn't it how the confidence can shift from one to the other Limo goes and gets a, a few meters thinks I've got this and then suddenly that lead disappears and then all of a sudden Jet Church says oh I've reeled it back in I can win this but the two of them right in the closing stages here this is going to come down to a sprint finish Jet Church 22 year old Cynthia Limo the sixth fastest half marathon runner of all time suddenly finding the sprint of the youngster looks as though it's a winning one here opens up to five six seven eight ten meters and look at her go Perez Jet Church here this could well be a new name for the Kenyans to cheer. She said she wants to go to Rio in the 10,000 metres on the track, but for the time being, she's going to be able to celebrate a brilliant win on the streets of Cardiff. Paris Jepchich here of Kenya wins the World Half Marathon. A quick time as well. Cynthia Limo takes the silver, and it will be just about a Kenyan 1-2-3. We'll watch for that, but goodness me, Perez Jepchich here. Look how surprised she is as we see the pre-race favourite, Mary Wan Sarah and Gugi coming in for the bronze medal. Couldn't hang on to a two teammates in the last two kilometers. Still a pretty quick time inside 68 minutes on a difficult day out there. But Kenya dominant once more as Gudetta rewarded with a fourth place finish. But well, we wonder, didn't we, in that, that effort, Paula, as we said, and uh, you know, and Gugi, sorry, um, uh, Limo knew perhaps felt and sensed that this youngster was going well made the big effort with about 800 to go but she was closed down and then what a finish from Jeff Church here yeah a great finish there and I think actually what happened there was Limo showed a little bit her fear um, by making that move and by trying to get away she showed that she was afraid of Jeff Church here Jeff Church here was able to reel her back in and get past her and I think a little bit went on there as well because Jeff Church here was looking at her watch a little bit and trying to judge maybe how far she had to the finish and I think it was only when maybe somebody shouted just how much she had left to, to go that she was able to launch that finish of hers um, and to move away pretty easily in the end from Limo for the victory there. There's Mo Farah and there you can see the leaders I would estimate about a hundred meters ahead of him at this point maybe a tad less than that certainly uh, nine ten seconds at the very least well that's not a, a sort of distance that you know, if uh, depending on the athletes, that you can think that well, that race is over. But when it contains Kamwara, when it contains Kuroki, 
and uh, a couple of the good Ethiopians in there as well, then you know that it's going to be a tough day for Mo, but he will be hoping that one or two of these have just overcooked this a little bit. Not those two, I don't think, and Tola doing a good job of staying involved. But when they went through Paula, 27.59 through 10K, if you were running that on the track, you wouldn't be that disappointed, to be fair. And 27.59, that means the second 5K was very quick indeed, inside 14 minutes. And that is fast. This is very fast running. Yeah, I mean, I think if we look down the, the stats, I'm not even sure what um, Mo's personal best is for 10,000 metres on the road, but I would guess that that's... He hasn't really raced it that much, but I would guess that's fairly close to it. Um, I mean, he's, he's keeping himself relaxed. He's definitely not out of this yet. Don't underestimate Mo Farah and how well he can stay focused on what he's doing and on his race in these middle stages of... and just work gradually away, at moving closer and closer to this group if he can. But these are two quality athletes in Kamwara and Karaki at the front here with Tola as well. But Kamwara and Karaki have that advantage of working together and have been able to kind of bounce off each other and take the surges on one at a time and be able to, to keep the pressure down, keep that foot on the pedal and not allow that gap to close. Well, this is interesting, isn't it? Because all of these guys, including Mo Farah, are running quicker than anyone would have expected. You know, Mo's gone through in 28.4 through 10K on the roads in a half marathon and you know for him as well you know this is a this is a race where he's kind of going to be stepping a little bit into a bit of unknown territory for himself because if he maintains that pace he's well on for a uh, or certainly going to be very very close to his personal best um, uh, but it's going to hurt now you know and this is going to be a test of his endurance where can he maintain this pace can he get under 59 minutes or certainly close to 59 minutes because that's the sort of pace he's set out at here yeah and that would be a phenomenal run don't forget that um, Mo Farah does hold the European record over the half marathon distance officially I think with his 59.32 from uh, Lisbon although he has run quicker on the South Shields Great North Run course but he is capable of going quicker than that again he hasn't really found himself to this point uh, in a really fast from the start half marathon and he certainly found himself in that today so he could walk away from this race here today not even getting a medal but having significantly improved his personal best and that European record so that's what's going on at the front Callum Hawkins went through 10k in a pretty swift 29.36 as well in 21st place Dowie Griffiths was 29.40 in 27th place behind him so they would be the three British counters. Ryan McLeod was a little further back. And in terms of the team race, of course, Kenya and Ethiopia well to the fore. And then the Eritreans who desperately were hoping they could get stay on the medal rostrum may well still be just about hanging on to the bronze medal at this point. So information in from our statistician Mark Butler, who's in Cardiff, is that Mohamed Mo's... Um, 10k PB is 27.44, so he wasn't that far outside it. So really quick pace being set in this world half marathon on the streets of Cardiff, despite the blustery conditions. Thankfully, things have settled somewhat. No umbrellas out there now. The rain has skirted by Cardiff and has gone through, hopefully. And the wind perhaps not quite as bad, certainly within the streets and around these sheltered areas as... Uh, one or two uh, suspecting it might be so fast fast running here these two guys at the front here with Tola trying to hang on to them two of the best distance runners in the world probably the two best at the moment and they've had their own head-to-heads you know they've raced each other eight times over the last sort of 15 months 18, uh, 18 months and uh, Kamwaro's won five Mushiri three that's on cross-country road and track so they know each other particularly well but at the moment they're locked together yeah, and another interesting stat there is that Karoki has actually never lost a half marathon. He's four for four wins across 2014, 2015. Um, so that's obviously a record that he isn't going to want to lose. And he has that experience and just maybe that knack for judging things right to get the victory. And if I understand um, his preparations correctly, I think he's intending to run London as well, the London Marathon. I'm pretty sure he's in the elite field for London, uh, Karoki. So 
a great indication here of perhaps what's to come in London this year if uh, we get a good day. So two at the front there for Kenya, pushing it on, trying to run Tola away out of it at the moment if they can. Tola himself, a 2-6 marathon runner, ran that in Dubai, and we always take, we shouldn't take the Dubai times with a little pinch of salt, but they tend to be a little bit quicker than many of the athletes often run elsewhere. But uh, he is with those two at the moment, and then a little bit of a gap. So, looking behind, Tola looking behind. I think these two at the front, obviously feeling things a little bit. We keep coming back to the fact, you, if you are just joining us, the guy who's at the front there, Jeffrey Kamoro, the pre-race favourite, fell on the start line and was almost trampled over by athletes uh, when, when you fall at the start, had to pick himself up and somehow, within a mile or so, got himself back into the lead group. Now, that, for me, Paula, that has got to tell. He looks as though he's working hard to me. You know, he's got that grimace on his face and... At this pace, even if he hadn't fallen, this would be hard work. But he fell, and you know that first mile probably was the equivalent—I don't know—of a 4:15 or something like that, because he would have lost 10, 15 seconds. He got up; they were running 4:30 pace, and he caught them. So you start a race with a 4:15, you've got to pay for that somewhere, surely. You have to, and um, I would have liked to have seen. I would like to have had maybe a GoPro or something on him to have seen how he managed to, to make that up as fast as he did, because he did time. kind of <laughs> catch us by surprise. If you're around that starting mile area, can you just tell us how he managed to to make that gap up as quickly as he did? But without a doubt, it has to hurt, as does racing at this pace. But he is the one who is pushing this on. Just a little bit back um, a while ago, there they spread out across the road, and you could see Karaki right on the other side of the road, almost looking across to. Kamora for a little bit of guidance and without doubts they will have discussed the tactics before this race and there will be a certain point that they will reach where it will be every man for himself and trying to go to win the victory but there 13.41 I mean it is the wind behind them and we did see the women run a very fast five kilometre split through there but no, I would hazard a guess that the wind has now picked up to 26 miles an hour um, but that certainly is a very, very fast middle section of the race and no wonder that Tola has been unable to stay with this and that those gaps going back towards Mo Farah are growing. Well, Paula, uh, you know, I hesitate to use the word, you know, world best, uh, etc. But these guys are operating quicker than we've ever seen before. Mo Farah, 22 seconds behind him. For me, that means Mo Farah has just broken the European 15 kilometer record on the roads. So, if he didn't know he was going fast, I'm not even sure if he knows what the 15K record is, but he has just broken it, I'm pretty sure, and um, that's something which I'm not sure he would have expected. 42.39 was the um, previous best, so if he was 22 seconds behind, he's well in the low end of 42 minutes. We'll get that officially for you. In fact, it's just coming up uh, for us at the moment. 42.03 officially through 15k so he's just knocked 20 odd seconds look how much he's hurting it, it, I, oh, Paula if these guys all of them including Mo don't slow down I'm, I'm going to be really surprised this is hard for Mo Farah it's in a tough tough race already but he's running faster than he's ever done before on the roads and that's got to give him some confidence yeah, and I think it's a long, long time since I've seen Mo Farah hurting that much in a race. I mean, probably back to uh, when he ran his marathon debut in London and he was hurting in the middle of the race and still pushing on. But the pace that he's running at, no wonder. Uh, and you'd almost kind of hope that he hasn't been able to have a look at that five kilometre split um, and to get that information. He will have seen the 15 kilometre, but I'm not sure, as you say, that will particularly register with him. But had he seen that these guys have just put in a five kilometre split at that pace I think that has to do some damage to you mentally even though he is keeping that gap and we said it was what about 100 meters and 22 seconds isn't that far off that so it's not growing significantly and it's not growing fast so any sign of a, a slowing from these two in front and I think Mo will be able to start moving back if he can keep his concentration and if he isn't fatiguing too much helps that he's starting to now pick off the Ethiopian athlete ahead of him 
The great Eritrean Tedessa, who's not here, is the man who has the fastest ever world half marathon time of 58.23. And these guys are operating in that zone. If they were to run around 14 minutes, 13.55, and then picked up the last kilometre, they'd be right on that world best of 58.23. But Mo Farah himself is setting records out on the roads in Cardiff, running quicker than he's ever done before. He may well slow down, and I'm sure these guys, if they don't slow down, this has been phenomenal, particularly from the man on the right, Jeffrey Kamwaro, who is there, who locked together with his teammate. This is what he expected, 10 miles. Well, we might not get a split, but I would say probably 44, 47, 44, 48. That is phenomenal. That is, in, the, in a half marathon, you would win 10-mile road races anywhere in the world with those sort of times. And these two have still got another three miles to go here. Surely it's got to pay. Surely they've got to slow down a little bit, because if they don't, we are heading for something really special here in Cardiff. Well, I think undoubtedly we are heading for something really special. They will turn and they will have to turn back into the wind, uh, but only for the last mile, mile and a half or so. And we didn't see that have a huge impact on the women's race. So I think it, the question is, can they just hold on and are they getting feedback out on the course of just how well they are running and what those gaps are? I think if you're certainly for Mo Farah out there today, he will be getting a lot of information, a lot of support from all of the people you can see who, who've come out today to maybe cheer people running in the mass race later on, but certainly to cheer Mo Farah and to give him information. And a lot of those will be taking those split times and shouting to, to Mo, come on, you've just got that 20, 25 seconds or so to make it up. You can see there Karaki just having a look back. He still looks comfortable, doesn't he? He still looks almost easier now than he did in the first couple of miles. Yeah, Karoki, the one who, um, well, you'd expect it, wouldn't you? I said, for, for Cam Worrell, this is an unbelievable performance. Now, look at that. I was just about to say the British team are doing very well here. Callum Hawkins is running great in 20th place and passing people at the moment. Dowie Griffiths himself in 26th place. Of course, the Welshman, as Paula was saying, will get huge support here. And he is moving up the field as well. He's about three minutes behind these leaders. And if they're assuming they keep going at this sort of pace, he's going to be heading for something in the uh, low 62s, maybe a bit quicker than that. Uh, who knows? Callum Hawkins' best is 62.39 that he set earlier this year. Uh, Griffiths, 64.28. He's going way faster than that. So if those two, you never know. The Eritreans went too hard. And although it's it's not positions here it's time and the Eritrean um, third counter is getting closer uh, their third and fourth counters are very close to the British athletes so they have got something to run at they probably won't know that Eritrea but they, they probably would guess wouldn't they if I'm passing an Eritrean then that means um, we're moving up the team rankings yeah, and I, I would hope that the team management, I'm going to have a dig here because my husband is part of the team management, would be out there on the course trying to, to feed that back to the runners because it is very much an individual race, but it is a team race too. And it's important to know that because that can spur you on knowing that your other teammates are doing really well out there and they're relying on you to keep going and to keep picking off seconds as well. It's not just about positions here. So even if you can move closer to the person in front of you, you're moving your team up those rankings. Bedan Kuroki Mushiri next to Jeffrey Kamwaro. The two of them have done brilliantly well here. Whatever happens at the end, they've got it between them in terms of the win. But look at that Tola who went with them for so long. Now passed by Mo Farah. Ayele who was doing that weaving around in the early stage. He's now being passed by Mo Farah. So Mo moving into the top four or five here. And that's something which will keep encouraging him he will keep picking people off if he can i said at the beginning that he wouldn't want some of these athletes to finish ahead of him whatever the style of the race he'll accept that those front two were always going to be the favorites but he's chasing a medal now he's got the chance of a medal perhaps in his sights cheprot uh, is third at the moment for kenya but mo isn't too far behind cheprot looked pretty strong in third place but mo may well be able to see him on the road ahead and hopefully he can keep hanging on there he's hurting as paula said like never before but he's also running faster than he's ever done before 
And that will have done his confidence a huge amount of good to see Tola come back to him like that and to move in front of him and to be able to look up the road and see that he is making inroads at least on that third position. So there he is, just going round the roundabout in third. Cheprot, that's the man who Farah has in his sights, trying to run him down. Can Mo Farah get a medal here and to boot a very quick time? Have these two slowed down? Does that look as though two men who are looking a little bit tired now? You would have no problem in excusing them in that because the pace has been so fast. They wanted to break Farah. They did that. In so doing, though, they have been running close to world record pace, and Mo Farah himself will be running quicker than he has ever done before. He's already broken one record out on the roads over 15K, the European record. That's gone to him by almost 20 seconds, which is phenomenal. They all have been, I'm pretty sure Paul is slowing down. I'd be really interested to see them as they get through 20K. It'll be somewhere, if it's still under 56 minutes, we're still in for something pretty quick. If it's down into the sort of 55, 40 region, we could still be close to a world best. Yeah, I think we will get an idea of that. But I mean, they have to slow down at some point, as you say. But from that angle, I know that's a little bit downhill there. It does not look as though they are slowing down at all. And they will know now that they are, well, even if they slow down, they're still inside the last 10 minutes of running here in this race. And when you're in a half marathon race and you know you're inside the last 10 minutes, you can hang on for that and you can start thinking about what you're going to do. You can just see a few glances at each other. Are they trying to chat as well at this pace? Um, but certainly now it comes down to when are they going to make their move to, to try and beat the other and to be able to try and win this race and they probably won't even be thinking about the times too much now they know they're running fast but it's important to both of them to get the victory here today well sadly for the quick time the rain has started again and you can see the wind is blowing through the trees and in the faces of the athletes here in the closing stages the umbrellas are up the encouragement is there for them but this is tough it's hard it's been an incredibly hot pace which has not been matched by the weather but they are still thrashing it out between the two of them here Kamwaro, what a performance from him having fallen at the start this is the very tired looking simon cheprot in third place at the moment mo farah cannot be too far away from him but they're all suffering they're all paying for that quick pace particularly those who really went into a, an area which they had no right to go into in terms of how quick they were going. But Farah is lasting it out better than anybody. He certainly is, and he's in good shape. He knows that he's in good shape. He wouldn't have wanted, to, wouldn't have come here today if he didn't know that he was well capable of, of challenging these guys over the half marathon distance. And I think that it will have been hard for him mentally to see that group move away and to see it go out as hard as it, as it did. But he's prepared for it. And if he walks away from this uh, today, having run a personal best and having run as well as he has done that will do his confidence a huge amount of good moving back now into the next period of training and building towards the Olympic Games in Rio well Mark Butler just remarking on the on the middle 10k for Mo Farah if you like from 5k to 15k he ran 27 31 he hasn't run he's run quicker on the track but not that many times on the track you know that would be a decent time on the track uh, more than decent time, for goodness sake. But yes, that is fast. Yeah, but you can't get the wind behind you the whole way on the track. Hey. <laughs> there he is, and there you see now the chance for him to take a bronze medal, perhaps. He's got the two Ethiopians moving through with him, Ayele and Tola, but Tola fell off that early pace. And now Cheprot will see he's got company. So this, the battle for third. Mo Farah is hurting. He's had to endure this super fast pace. He's running quicker than he's ever done before. Can he maintain and be strong through to the end? A little glance across to the Kenyan as we now concentrate on the battle at the front. Who is going to win this? They're approaching 20 kilometers, and I'll be really interested to see what sort of time these two are producing. I keep saying, Paula, Jeffrey Kamwaro, if he wins this race and he runs, he, 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 OK, so it's not a world's best. So it's 58-45 or something. What a performance that would be.
I think it would be an amazing performance for whatever time he won in here, in here today were he to win. Having had a fall of that magnitude and the, the damage that that must have done, he must have knocked and bruised his body there. Uh, and it's phenomenal running to get back up to rejoin as quickly as he did and to keep pushing the pace. Just trying to work out in my head there how much that gap is. I think it's probably stayed roughly around the same of that 20 second margin. You can see they've gone through 12 miles in the background there. So they are fast approaching that 20 kilometer mark. And hopefully as the screen freezes now, hopefully we will get um, a little bit more uh, of a picture of how close that gap is. Now, already in that last, since 15 kilometers, Mohamed um, Farah has made up over 20 seconds on Tola, gone past him and moved into that pack fighting for the bronze medal. Apologies for the loss of pictures from Cardiff and uh, we'll get them back to you as quickly as we can. And uh, as Paula was saying, the race has reached uh, such a critical point, such a shame that uh, the weather finally seems to have um, affected the performance here. That 27.31 um, I was referring to was in fact for the leaders. Uh, I myself was um, getting mixed up with the stats there. And uh, yes, 27.31 Paula just seeing how fast and how hard that pace is and to run that sort of pace on the roads is incredible. We're hoping to get those pictures back as uh, here we are finding out. Look at that. This is such a shame because Again, we apologise for having lost the pictures, but you can perhaps see why. Look at that. Oh, my word. We hope we were going to get away with it. So did they, and it's such a shame that it's going to affect this race in such a way in the latter stages because these guys were heading for such fast times. Mo's looking for shelter. Goodness me, um, he needs an umbrella, and uh, he's, t he's doing the smart thing there, Paula, tucking in behind the taller figures there, but they're all head down, bowed into the wind. But look at Jeffrey Kamwaro. This is incredible from him. This is amazing running, and you can see just why we lost the pictures there with the wind and the rain now coming down. It's almost horizontal rain, and I would say that Mo didn't need an umbrella there because he might have been like Mary Poppins going backwards in the wrong direction. Um, so I think he's doing the job now of trying to shelter him, but look how quickly that gap has opened up, and certainly we talked about that 10K split for Karakiv, 27-31. That obviously has done damage to him. I think he's paying the price for those surges we saw in the early stages, but can it is just phenomenal that he's been able to do this and he's uh, one man who is pretty much unbeatable on the cross country on the road won world titles at those distances and then does have that silver medal on the track so if we were to have a grand slam of, of, of distance racing as there's been some talk about trying to encourage uh, interest in cross country uh, again and to kind of build that up he would be the man who is the most hotly tipped to be able to do that in the near future on the track to be able to do that though, of course <laughs> well he's certainly for me added to all of our adulation to, of him as an athlete because to fall at the start in the way which he did and to, if it weren't for these conditions at the end at the very least he would have run a personal best here he's not going to be too far off at that 5k split 14 25 as paula was saying uh, Karoki in particular has paid for that. Look at that gust of wind almost blowing Kamwara over. Uh, Mo Farah there trying to work hard. Look at the debris being blown across the road. He's being cheered on. The fans trying to do their best here, but incredibly difficult conditions for the athletes. When you get out, when you're protected, and then you go across a street junction, the wind can suddenly come whipping in from the side and upset your balance. But this guy, Paula, he's going to run close to 59 minutes. His best is 58-54. He was almost, he, he would have run in a sensible race with not falling down, etc. Conditions to contend with, particularly in these last two or three miles. He's still going to run an incredibly quick time, looking behind, but hats off to him. Well, yeah, your hats have all been blown off, but you know what I mean. Well, he lost his hat at the start, didn't he? And I think if you look at that, even those pictures again from the start, he was at least 10 seconds, if not 15 seconds, actually on the floor before he got up again uh, and was running. So even if you take out all of the factors of the impact and whether, whether he bruised or hurt anywhere, when he fell, there were athletes clambering over his back. The fact that he got up, that he moved up so quickly to be able to close that gap and then really controlled this race. And he, I think he has to thank Karaki as well for the way they've worked together in not being wilted by the conditions. And I think they're approaching now the turn in, so it is going to be very low, 59 minutes. 
Jeffrey Kamwaro of Kenya, the world cross-country champion, and he's won this one before. He's the world silver medalist on the track, but this may well be one of his best performances ever. He's going to cross the winning line or the finish line to win the world half marathon title in the worst of conditions in Cardiff in a very, very quick time, given everything that happened today, including falling at the finish line, picking himself up, sorry, at the start line, having to pick himself up, get himself back in the race, catch everybody else up, and then one by one, they all fell away. His teammate, Bidan Karoki, will take the silver medal. And as Paula said, he perhaps should be thanked for the way in which he pulled Kamwaro away from the field. The two of them at times in the middle there, 27.31, the middle 10K, operating at great track pace. And talking about track pace, Mo Farah with his big traditional sprint at the end. He's going to try and hold off Ayala for the bronze medal. Is he going to do it? Ayala's coming back at him. Farah takes one more look behind and just checks. He gets the bronze medal for Great Britain. Mo Farah crosses the line just inside 60 minutes. Well done to him. That was hard. And he will take with him a European record on the roads over 15 kilometers as well. A tough, tough race, and not a result which I think Mo will be absolutely delighted with. A real testimony to his endurance because to go out as hard as he did, they tried to destroy him as they did with many of the others. He ended up coming through, biding his time a little bit. He was still running very, very fast, but staying strong in the latter stages, hanging on to this incredible pace and coming away with a bronze medal. After all of that hard work, it's great to come away with something. He probably didn't appreciate the sprint at the end, but that's what he's good at. But I still say, Paula, that for me was an incredible performance from Jeffrey Kamwaro. That was a really, really phenomenal performance, and I think that that will do him a lot of good. Without doubt, he's prepared for this race. It didn't go smoothly at the beginning by any means, but he certainly made up for that, and he was able to get back and show the form that he was in and just missed the championship record by 10 seconds. And what did we say, 10 seconds? He was probably on the floor. So even in these conditions, I think the Cardiff organisers were bang on the money when they said that they designed this course and that it was possible to run very, very fast on it maybe helped a little bit by the wind at their backs on certain points of it, but it was a very, very fast course. And those conditions, nobody could have foreseen how bad they would be, I think, in the last couple of miles. Certainly for the women's race, it was nothing like that. But for Mo Farah, I think he will go away annoyed and frustrated that he's been beaten on British soil. He never likes that, but he has to be very proud of the run that he's put together there and the way that he stayed focused, having run so fast in the early stages in the middle section of that race. Well, everything was thrown at him, wasn't it? The weather, yes, tough competition and a fall at the start to boot, but despite all of that, there you can see the damage of the fall. Scraped knees and it could have been so much worse, but he managed to pick himself up. I've no idea what his first mile was, but it would have been very, very quick indeed because they were running quick at the beginning. And to have the strength and the, not only in terms of his body if you like but the strength of mind not to panic get himself back in the race and then stay with the incredible pace being set they were very close to world record world best pace until the last three or four miles and then the weather came and had its say as well but he stood strong and won and in the women's race it was a gold medal and a title for Perez Jepchich here, the great young t Kenyan talent, 22 years of age, won by three seconds from the two pre-race favourites, Cynthia Limo and Mary Wasera Ngugi. Kenya once again coming out on top, one, two and three. Some good performances a little bit further down. Eloise Wellings ended up in 12th place. Sarah Hall, a bit of a comeback for her. The Americans doing pretty well. Uh, Australia also packing well. The first of the British athletes was Ali Dixon in 27th place, running 72.57, a solid enough run from her. She still did start pretty quickly, but uh, hung on pretty well. I can tell you behind her, Charlotte Purdue finished in 33rd place with a new, well, with the season's best of 73.20.
And all of that meant in the team standings, obviously, they take the cumulative times of their best three performers. Kenya winning with a good four, well, three and a half minutes to spare. Ethiopia second. And once again, Japan finishing third. But this time only just ahead of Australia. Wasn't much in it in the end. The United States were in fifth place. A little further down, Great Britain finished in 11th place. Tina Muir was 49th, the 75-12. So Tina was the third of the British trio to count in the team performance. Well, the rain is lashing down, and the worst of the weather came right at the end, which is perhaps thankful for all of those who are in the mass race. Around 16,000 were scheduled to start. Not the best of days for them in terms of running, although sometimes uh, cooler weather is pretty good. But they all, when they get home, will, I'm sure, um, think they've had a great day. And they'll be told the story of the men's race in particular. Jeffrey Kamwara winning with 59 minutes and 10 seconds. Not that far off his personal best in the most trying of conditions, despite falling at the start. Bedan Karoki Muchiri taking the silver. And Mo Farah with a traditional sprint finish, taking the bronze medal on a tough day, but a very good day for him. That's a good result for Mo Farah, and he'll be very, very happy with that performance, I'm very sure. And so will Callum Hawkins. Well done to him, 15th place. That's a great performance from him, 62-51, top 15 in the World Half Marathon Championships. That's very good as well. Paul Pollock just ahead of him uh, from Ireland with a season's best of 62-46. And then a little further down, Dowie Griffiths with a new personal best. He fell away a little bit. Everybody went off hard today and then fell away. I presume those conditions affected everybody in the last couple of miles, but he still ran a personal best, was heading for well under 64 at one point, but 64-10 for him. So they are the three British counters. And... In the team race, then, that means, sadly for Britain, no medal. They weren't too far away from it, though, were they? As expected, though, the medals going in the team race to Kenya. A clear win for them ahead of Ethiopia. And then a big gap in terms of time to Eritrea, who just about hung on to the bronze medal ahead of Great Britain, who will be very, very pleased. Great Britain and Northern Ireland in fourth place in the team race, of course, led by Mo Farah. There's many congratulations. How does it feel to be a world champion? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, tell us about the race, because I think many people were expecting uh, Cynthia or, or Mary to perhaps win, but in the end it's you. Oh, the race was not bad. Uh, the course was good, but a little bit climbing the hill. And the other place, which was raining, the other place was not raining. Yeah. Yes, I mean, Paula Radcliffe, who's won this event three times, says that you run in many conditions. But just how difficult was the, the weather and the wind and the rain for you? Oh, the weather was uh, too pretty. It was heavy because it was windy. It was too much windy. Yeah. Especially when we are turning the right hand, it was so windy. And from now, what are your plans between now? Will you try to get to Rio to do maybe 10,000 metres? What are your plans? Yeah, in Godwin, I plan to run 10,000. If I qualify in my trials, I will be running. More well, many congratulations. A uh, world bronze medal half marathon. How does that feel? Yeah, not disappointed today. Um, you know, it's great support from the home crowd, so it would be nice to come up with a, with a win. But, you know, but after you won on a day, the guys are strong. But they just went for it, and I just couldn't quite go with it. You sound pretty tough on yourself, but you were just under the one-hour mark, especially in these conditions and with a frightening pace as well. Yeah, it was an incredible pace. I looked at the 10K pace, and they were just going for it. But then quite a bit of it, I was, I was alone. So um, to be honest with you, it is a fast time. It's, not, it's, it, it's just, you know, as an athlete, you always want to win. You're saying how you were alone. Um, you had five Kenyans and five... Ethiopians for the most part ahead of you. How difficult is it though to be the lone man trying to get among the medals in a race like this? It's pretty difficult but at the same time you know it's one of these things you go with it or you know you have to pay the price. <laughs> so a bronze medal, a fast time in difficult conditions, what do you read into this as you work towards Rio? 
it's definitely the Rio's the aim. Uh, the guys are going to be stronger in Rio, so I'm going to I'm going to work hard, and you know this is just gives me a massive motivation. Well, Jeffrey, um, world half marathon champion for the second time in a row. How does that feel? It's really it's really great. Uh, it's really important for me. Actually, I'm really happy to defend my title. So the fact that I fell down from the start, so but uh, no problem. I stay strong. Just tell us what happened at the start and, and how much of an effort did it take to get back to the front? OK, it's unfortunate from the start. I fell down and I say I, I will not give up. I, I'll go as a champion. And I'm really happy and encouraged to win the race. This was the fact of the challenge. I know that you, before you came here, you wanted to break the world record. The conditions were terrible. What was it like being out there and you ran a fast time anyway? Actually, I was uh, trying to run the fastest time, but it's unfortunate of the weather. It was raining a lot, but we tried our best. And uh, in Beijing last year, Mo Farah beat you in the 10,000. What does this say about your form as you work towards maybe taking gold in Beijing? Actually, it's really, it means a lot for me being an important year with uh, around 10,000. I'm really looking forward to participating in 10,000.